Perfect. So welcome to back to BPK four two six, and the week of this lecture always corresponds with um, International Suicide Prevention Week. And so I normally give a, a small announcement at the beginning of the course. Sometimes we have student reps come in and, and speak a little bit. Obviously, that's not going to happen in 2020. Um, but I will have raised the issue uh, anyway. So uh, you can see everything on the slide, sort of three very different approaches to the same message. Um, when I did a postdoc in England, I loved the, the whiteboards on the tube, on the British tube, um, and uh, London tube, I guess. And so this is their International Suicide Prevention Day message. Um, eminently quotable Ernest Hemingway, um, who I'm a big fan of. Um, and of course, if you know me, you know that uh, I, my continuing homage to Brain and Heart um, and the Awkward Yeti. So, um, you know, just a reminder um, about suicide warning signs and talking about suicide, they can look very different from person to person. And one of the things that I like to emphasize um, that I think is, is a really important data-driven message is that the data now clearly show that asking someone about suicide does not put suicidality into their head. It is not harmful to ask someone whether they're thinking of committing suicide. And so it, in contrast, actually asking someone directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? And the follow-up question, of course, do you have a plan to do so? These are potentially life-saving questions and anyone can ask them. So none of us are therapists, um, or a few of us I assume, if we're listening to this, are therapists, um, but anyone can ask these questions. And, and in contrast to popular opinion, they are not harmful. Um, they are potentially life-saving. Um, and so from suicide to another leading cause of death, um, which is vascular accidents. Uh, and so in the case of the brain, we're talking about strokes. Um, the reason for talking about strokes so early in the course is that it is a great way to test uh, functional anatomy. So, um, so two parts to this, it goes in both directions. If you look at number two, um, you use your knowledge of anatomy to predict deficits in response to loss of blood flow in a certain vessel or region. Um, <coughs> region. Uh, and also you can look at a clinical presentation of deficits and localize vascular damage, predict where ischemia occurred. Now, we did a bit of this in 326. We're gonna up the ante substantially in 426. Um, and we're going to start with talking about uh, clinical descriptions of vascular accidents and just a bit of terminology that people often get uh, muddled when they're talking about stroke. So, uh, as I've just said, one of the most important clinical ramifications of um, functional anatomy, and it, the slide says of the cerebral hemispheres, but not just cerebral hemispheres, also um, white matter and deep brain nuclei and the brain stem and the cerebellum. Um, one of the most important clinical, relevant, clinically relevant pieces of all of these regions is what happens when blood supply is disrupted transiently or persistently. And so you should be very familiar now with all of the functional regions that are mapped and shown here in this lateral view and in this medial view of the brain. Um, and we're going to talk about functional effects of loss of blood flow to all of these and more regions in the course. So we'll start with some basic terminology. Um, so an ischemic stroke refers to blood flow obstructed to a portion of the brain. And the obstruction um, can be a clot or a plaque or more rarely even a, a, bowl, a bubble, right? Um, and this is really hypoxia without bleeding, is an ischemic stroke. Now I've seen different numbers based on which sort of um, meta-analysis or review you're looking at, but certainly the large proportion of all strokes are ischemic. So this, this study says about 85%, I've read as high as 90%. So ischemic stroke is by far the most common. Hemorrhagic stroke, 
um, is the rupture of a portion of a blood vessel um, and or a blood vessel and causes blood to leak into the surrounding brain tissue. So in this can happen in any portion of the brain and hemorrhagic strokes are by far the minority of all strokes. So depending on what you read again, 10 to 15% of strokes would be classified as hemorrhagic or actively bleeding, whereas 85 to 90% of strokes are ischemic, blocking blood flow to an area, creating ischemia and hypoxia without active bleeding. Couple of other terms that are really important around stroke. Um, one is infarction. So infarction is tissue death or necrosis due to inadequate blood supply. Um, and the blood supply can be um, an artery blocked, an artery ruptured, mechanical compression, or um, non-physiological pathological vasoconstriction. All of those can produce a lesion, which is then referred to as an infarct. So infarction is, is tissue loss due to hypoxia, secondary to inadequate blood supply, and the lesion that results that you see on imaging is an infarct. Um, in, in sort of the, the literature on myocardial infarction, so heart attack, um, loss of blood in the coronary vasculature, uh, the phrase is time is muscle or time is heart. Well, in the stroke literature, the phrase is time is brain. And human nervous tissue is rapidly and irretrievably lost when blood flow is blocked. And so it's exquisitely sensitive to hypoxia. For example, this is the, in this one stroke paper, so one sort of review of available data, these are the, this is the modeling predicts the number of neurons lost, the number of synapses lost, the myelinated fibers lost, and the years of acceler or hours or years of accelerated aging with a stroke at any of these times. So if you have a stroke um, that lasts a second, a transient loss of blood flow, um, you lose 32,000 neurons, 230 million synapses, and 218, in this case yards, it's an American paper, um, of myelinated fibers. If you have a stroke that lasts an hour, you lose 120 million neurons, 830 billion synapses, and you age three and a half years. And then the average stroke, the neuronal loss is in the order of billions, the synaptic loss is the order of trillions, and the average estimate of accelerated aging is 35 or 36 years. And so stroke is a huge clinical problem even when it's not when it's survivable right so there's a huge neurological cost of average strokes this also has huge repercussions um, for transient ischemic attacks or tias mini strokes right so think about in every mini stroke if someone has many mini strokes they're taking um, neuron synaptic connections and years off their life Now, in ischemic stroke, so this is loss of blood flow without bleeding, the frontline treatment is a clot buster. So TPA is the most common one. It's a potent thrombolytic agent or clot buster. Um, and the problem is twofold. So the problem is getting that TPA in quickly enough to be effective and making sure we're not delivering TPA in this scenario. Because of course, if you give a clot bluster to someone with active bleeding in the brain, you could have a catastrophic outcome. Now the odds are in our favor of this scenario over this scenario, but it's not quite always that simple. So I'll move ahead to this slide for just a moment. So hemorrhagic strokes can be primarily hemorrhagic, which is a blood vessel ruptures and blood leaks into the brain. There can also be a secondary hemorrhagic conversion, which means you start out with this scenario where a blood vessel is occluded and pressure builds up proximal to the occlusion and then the blood vessel ruptures. 
So over time, following an ischemic stroke, you can have a secondary hemorrhagic conversion. Now, as you might imagine, if you give a clot buster in any, either of these scenarios, um, you exacerbate bleeding into the brain and, and ultimately exacerbating the region of the brain that's hypoxic um, and potentially with a catastrophic outcome. Now, the previous window for TPA, even when we can reliably determine that there's no active bleeding um, through imaging, is really difficult to achieve. So the goal is four and a half hours from known onset of stroke, the appearance of symptoms. Um, and the protocol in many emergency rooms is to get people from the door to the cath lab within one hour, 60 minutes after, after presenting at the emergency room. Um, and so again, this is sort of one standard I'm taking it. Some EDs may operate with slightly shorter windows. Um, there's a study last, last year that suggests that this window may be able to be extended for up to nine hours post ischemic stroke, both safely and still conferring some benefit. So this is in 2019. I haven't followed up on this, um, but they are trying to expand the TPA window for obvious reasons, both to give time for imaging to confirm um, that there is no secondary hemorrhagic conversion and to deliver the TPA within a still um, effective window for the patient. Um, since stroke is likely, it's so common, it's likely to affect all of us at some point, these may be conversations that you're having about, you know, your friends, your family, your relatives. So, so it's really quite, you know, pertinent information probably for all of us. One thing I learned um, when I was doing research uh, at a spinal cord injury center is we, because we had a remarkably smooth and accessible um, floor, they would bring uh, different walking groups for indoor, safe indoor walking and rehabilitation exercise uh, to the center. And one of the craziest things was the age of many of the people who were in rehab after stroke. And they were in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s. So certainly there were also older people, but what freaked me out is, is how many people have strokes at a young age. And I really didn't know that before graduate school. So going back to the definitions here a bit, so we've learned, we know what a hemorrhagic versus an ischemic stroke is, and we know there also can be primary hemorrhagic stroke or secondary hemorrhagic conversion. Um, there's multiple types of ischemic stroke, and these terms are sort of often a little confusing. So an embolic stroke um, involves an embolus, which is a bit of stuff that forms in one place and then zips through the bloodstream to get stuck in another. And so in the case of an embolic stroke in the brain, uh, a, a piece of material such as a blood clot in the leg has zipped, broken free and zipped to the brain um, and got lodged ultimately in a vessel. A thrombotic infarct is a local clot in a vessel and usually it's at the site of an, uh, an underlying, uh, underlying plaque on the vessel wall. So the vessel's been narrowing for some time and finally pinches off uh, and that local clot um, causes the stroke. So that's a thrombus versus an embolus. An embolus is remotely located and a thrombus is local. Now, um, in 326, we talked um, exclusively about large vessel infarcts, right? So the, the blockage of, of the cerebral arteries unilaterally, the MCA, PCA, or ACA. Um, what's much more common clinically is small vessel infarcts. And of course, this makes sense. So if you have an embolus zipping through the circulation, it's likely to make it, if it travels toward the brain, into the internal carotid, probably into the MCA, but much, but likely to get lodged in a small vessel um, that is a branch, in this case, of the MCA. And so small vessel infarcts are very common, and they involve vessel um, the small penetrating vessels that supply deep structures of the brain. And so um, here we're looking at the cerebral hemispheres. That can mean the basal ganglia, the thalamus, 
and as well as white matter tracts. And in the brain stem, this includes often the medial portions of the midbrain pons and medulla, although they can be anywhere. Um, small vessel infarcts are sometimes called lacunar infarcts or lacoons, and this is from the uh, Latin for uh, a small lake. It's not a scenic lake, it's like a pit or a ditch. And so this is a lacoon um, as it presents in imaging section, digital section. And so I'll pause for a second here, and I will really pause just to make it legit and to make sure the recording's working and everything. Um, and I'll ask several questions. So first, what is the plane orientation and imaging modality that you're seeing here? Um, where is this lacunar stroke? And I'll give you a hint, it's in a white matter region. What motor deficits might you predict? in a general way, because we're coming to more detail on this, and what other um, localized infarct location uh, could produce similar or identical symptoms. And I'll actually, I'll get you to bypass lacunar for the moment on this slide. So cross that out and replace it with localized. So lacunar typically means a small spot within the brain and I just want you to think about a localized infarct location that will produce similar or identical symptoms to this scenario. And we'll take it up in a moment. Orientation um, and imaging modality should be fairly straightforward. It's a horizontal, axial, or transverse plane. Um, the right side of the image is the left side of the patient. In this case, this is lacunar stroke has affected the left cerebral hemisphere. Um, and the imaging modality is MRI. And I can tell that because of the really nice resolution of sulci and gyri I see here in the brain. And if you squint, you can tell the difference between gray matter and white matter um, in this deep region of the brain. And that's relevant to our lacoon. So this lacunar stroke, I gave you the hint, is in the interior, uh, pardon me, internal capsule, and it's actually in the posterior limb of the left internal capsule. Now, in order to talk about what motor deficits um, and what other infarct location would produce similar deficits, we'll talk a little bit, um, go ahead for a second about the internal capsule, and then come back. So I've already told you that the corticospinal tract, or CST for short, is not the sole um, mediator of descending motor control, but it's certainly a primary mediator of descending motor control. Uh, so we'll start with it and its mapping in the internal capsule. So as you can see here, and all of you hopefully know, that upper motor neurons in the left precentral gyrus, or primary motor cortex, extend long axons that travel and cross the midline at the pyramidal decussation, um, travel caudally, I didn't finish that sentence, and cross the midline at the pyramidal decussation in the caudal medulla. And I don't want to do with my hands without a pointer, anyway. Um, and so they cross the midline and travel, the majority of them in the lateral CST, and ultimately innervate the lower motor neuron in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And so via this, the left primary motor cortex governs the musculature on the right side of the body. Now, you can see in the schematic, and you probably recall, that the corona radiata funnels information from a relatively broad swath of motor cortex into a very small, um, deep region of the brain. And so here you can see the precental gyrus, this broad swath of cortex, funneling via the um, immediately deep white matter, the corona radiata, into a very narrow region of territory within the internal capsule. And if we look at sort of the parts of the internal capsule that we're most familiar with, and that is the same view as this image, more or less, um, we can see the V shape of the internal capsule. Here's the posterior limb. Here's the anterior limb, and where they meet is the genu, because similar to the knee, it's a bend. 
in this arrangement of suction. And so here is again a larger image, um, a large schematic of the what's represented in the internal capsule. And in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, we have the majority of corticospinal tract fibers and they're organized with some somatotopy. So the arms are medial to the trunk, which in turn is medial to the representation of the legs. So in terms of medial to lateral arrangement in the capsule, it's roughly inverted to what it is in the cortex, where arms and face are lateral and legs are medial. And this is on the posterior limb. The face of the cortical bulbar tract between primary motor cortex and the brainstem, the, the lower motor neurons of the cranial nerves, um, governing facial musculature, is roughly mapped to the genu, or the bend in the internal capsule. And then the anterior limb um, creates connections between uh, regions of the brain and brainstem, like the frontopontine fibers, corticofugal means projections from the brain to the brainstem, as well as some of the sensory um, thalamic radiations in the anterior limb. So looking at this map, we can now talk about what kind of deficits this patient is gonna have. So the, mo the deficits they would have in, with a lacoon in the posterior limb of the internal capsule would be primarily motor and contralaterally mapped so that means that this left-sided lacoon would produce hemiparesis or hemiparalysis on the right side of the body. Um, and the, the, this is called a pure motor stroke. So really the only symptom um, of a posterior limb stroke, if it's restricted to the posterior limb of the internal capsule, um, is a paralysis that's contralateral um, and it can be weakness, paresis, um, involving uh, the arms, the trunk, or the legs. If the damage is restricted to the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Um, now the other question is how would you distinguish between, well there's two related questions here. So that pure motor stroke could also be produced either by this tiny lacuner infarct, which let's say for the sake of argument, affects the arm, trunk, and legs of regions, tracts of the internal capsule, it could also be produced by a relatively large um, cortical stroke. So a stroke of the primary motor cortex involving uh, the arm region, the trunk region, and the leg region of the upper motor neurons. These are still upper motor neurons, but these are axons. And so because of this funneling effect, it would have to be a much geographically or surface area larger cortical stroke to produce the same damage as this tiny, the same clinical effect as this tiny lacunar infarct deep in the internal capsule. And that's because of the funneling. So the answer I was looking for here is what other localized infarct, well, it wouldn't be too localized, it would be an infarct localized to the primary motor cortex would produce similar symptoms. And it would be cortical damage involving the arm, trunk, and leg regions of the primary motor cortex. The related question over here is how would you distinguish between a lateral lenticular stri stroke and just file the away for a minute, um, call that an internal capsule stroke, the lenticulostriate vessels are the ones that supply the internal capsule, and a cortical stroke based on clinical presentation. And so this is an important concept. How would I predict whether the stroke occurred here or in the motor cortex? And the answer is really a presence or absence of cortical signs. So a stroke that was large enough on the cortex to affect the arms, trunk, and legs region of the primary motor cortex is very likely to be associated with a sign, another effect on the cortex. And cortical effects include aphasia, is kind of a classical 
cortical effect, um, a spatial, hemi, a visual spatial deficit like hemi neglect, which Sam and I will talk about later in the course, um, some disorder of executive function, so a related portion of the frontal lobe. So all of those are examples of cortical signs. And so the stroke that we're looking at here would create a pure motor syndrome because it's only affecting the white matter in the posterior internal capsule. Therefore, it would be devoid of cortical signs, speech, um, visual spatial perception, and executive function would all be spared in this instance. This YouTube video is a great introduction and discussion of the anatomy of the internal capsule. He also speaks with a lovely British accent, so it's quite soothing. Now, you certainly don't have to memorize all of these syndromes, but I do want you to get the idea that although they're small sort of in surface area, you can see there's a scale on this image and it shows you like we're talking about, you know, strokes that are a centimeter um, in sort of one to two centimeters in in territory can have really dramatic effects because they're involving the white matter or the deep brain nuclei as opposed to the cortex. And in terms of, you know, centimeter for centimeter, cortex is relatively disposable. Um, as that information funnels down and is condensed in the CNS into the internal capsule and ultimately to the brainstem, um, a, a one centimeter stroke can have an absolutely catastrophic functional outcome. So um, what I'm looking for you to take away from sort of this table is that the posterior internal capsule results in a pure motor hemiparesis. Um, so pure motor hemiparesis is uh, weakness. Paralysis would be the more severe form on one side of the body. Paresis is weakness. And dysarthria is a non-cortical um, difficulty in producing speech. So dysarthria um, would Im is when the muscles that you use to form words are paralyzed or weak and your speech is garbled as a result. So this is not a cortical aphasia, right? And that would map, dysarthria hemiparesis, would map to damage um, of the genu of the internal capsule. Whereas a pure motor hemiparesis affecting the arms, trunk, and legs would map to posterior limb damage of the internal capsule. And of course, you can have these syndromes um, in other places, including the pons and less commonly the corona radiata um, or the peduncles of the cerebrum, the white matter tract, largely white matter bundles um, that connect the brain to the brainstem. Um, you can have uh, your pure motor hemiparesis or pure motor hemiparalysis can, can also be ataxic. Um, ataxia is loss of balance and coordination. And similarly, using similar logic, you could have a purely sensory stroke. And that would happen if you lost all, if, if you had a stroke within the, the VPL of the thalamus. So that would be a slightly more medially shifted lacoon on section, and it would wipe out um, all of the sensory input in the contralateral face and body with no other symptoms. Similarly, you could have a basal ganglia lacoon that would um, that could cause either a limited symptom or something called hemibolismus, which is an inability to inhibit movements. And you get these weird unilateral um, crazy movements that you can't control. And so the point about this is that posterior limb of the internal capsule would create a pure motor syndrome in the body. The genu of the internal capsule would create a pure motor symptom affecting the mouth and face. Um, a lacune in the thalamus would create a pure sensory syndrome and a lacune in the basal ganglius would create a pure motor control syndrome. So those are sort of the, the takeaways from this table. And all of the other scenarios, including an anterior limb internal capsule uh, stroke, while possible, are more complex. And so
Um, so we're not going to sort of accurately predict those in detail. Of course, I do want you to appreciate that that can happen. Now, that is all hopefully new to many of you. And this should be all hopefully reviewed to many of you. So you can sit back, have a sip of coffee and, and relax for a few minutes. So all of you should know by now, coming to 426, that the blood supply to the brain arises from two prior major sources. Um, the posterior circula circulation, which arises from the vertebral arteries, and the anterior circulation, which arises from the internal carotids. And so um, on our uh, right here, we have both of those in sort of a frontal, infrafrontal view of the skull. Uh, and on our left of the slide, we're looking at the whole circulatory system in a lateral view. And just important to remember, when you take a lateral view, all of this is mirror image on the opposite side. So we'll start with the posterior. Um, the vertebral arteries arise from the subclavian arteries bilaterally. They ascend and travel through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae. Um, and they take a little zigzag here at, above the atlas to access the intracranial vault. They then merge and form the basilar artery, which lays over the brainstem. The anterior circulation, um, the internal uh, carotid arteries arise bilaterally. I'm showing it in the frontal view here from the common carotid artery. So on both sides, um, with a slightly different um, point of origin, the common carotid, common carotid arteries ascend toward the brain. They branch roughly at the level of the C5 vertebral body in most people um, to give rise to the external carotid supplying the face and the internal carotid supplying the brain. Now, the internal carotid supply by far um, most blood to the brain. So most estimates say about 80%. And that includes most of the cerebral cortex. The vertebral arteries, that posterior circulation is shown here in yellow, uh, they merge um, and form the basilar artery and the posterior cerebral arteries. And those combination of, of vessels supply about 20% of blood to the brain, but crucially supply the brain stem and cerebellum. So as I've already alluded to, strokes in small condensed CNS spaces can be catastrophic and strokes of the brainstem particularly so. So the brainstem is tiny. Um, the spinal cord is about the diameter of your pinky finger. The brainstem may be the diameter of a larger finger or thumb. Um, but when you, I might have a brainstem actually I'm in the lab. Aha, I have a brainstem. So that is the diameter of the brainstem. Right? So at its maximum diameter, it's about the, the diameter of my ring finger. Um, and it contains the nuclei that govern heart rate and, and breathing. And so the brainstem strokes or any brainstem injury whatsoever is, is almost inevitably catastrophic. And so 20% of the brain, but it happens to be the part of the brain that keeps us, keeps us alive. Now, the circle of Willis, which we've all learned dogmatically, um, is actually only complete or dogmatic in about 25% of us. And so this is the arterial polygon that we know and love. It's formed on the inferior um, or ventral surface of the brain. And it sort of forms this polygon that surrounds the optic chiasm medially, as well as the infundibulum um, of the pituitary stalk. So the pituitary dangles off of the brain within the circle of Willis. And the vessels that comprise it, you should be very familiar with. So the left and right internal carotids, um, the initial segments of both anterior cerebral arteries, as well as the singular anterior communicating artery. The posterior regions are the left and right posterior communicating arteries the initial segments of the left and right posterior cerebral arteries and this singular basilar artery, which often contributes right at its tip to the formation of the circle of Willis. So a couple of other arteries that we sort of gloss over in 326 or maybe ignore altogether, depending on whether you took it in a pandemic or 
out of a pandemic in the in the pre-pandemic times. Um, a couple important arteries I do want to mention. They are part of the anterior circulation. So the anterior choroidal artery is a branch that arises directly from the internal carotid. Uh, it supplies the optic chiasm and the optic tract, as well as some deep brain structures anteriorly. So that is an artery you need to be aware of. So a very proximal branch of the internal carotid prior or proximal to where it splits to give rise to the MCA and the ACA. Another branch, uh, distal to the anterior choroidal in most people, but arising directly from the internal carotid, is the ophthalmic artery. And it's, of course, bilateral. And it enters the orbit and crucially supplies the retina. So just two little arteries that branch off of the internal carotid and the anterior circulation that we will talk about. And all of these arteries that should be familiar um, from 326 you want to know them as well as the territory that they supply now the internal carotid people it's really hard to envision how this accesses the skull and so the internal carotid is arising go back to this image um inferior it's arising and it's ascending toward the brain and then there's an, a critical junction here where it tra traverses from pre-petrous or before the bone to a petrous segment where it travels within the, um, within the temporal bone. And I'll just show you what that looks like because people have trouble envisioning that. And so it arises, as I've said, from the common carotid artery and you can see here it's enveloped um, in autonomic nerves, so those crucially regulate uh, tone in the internal carotid artery. And as it's ascending, it enters via the carotid canal, and then it takes a boop, oh, where's my pointer? Boop, hor uh, 90 degree turn. And this, after it enters, is called the petrous portion because it's all contained within the temporal bone. And so it enters at the carotid canal and travels over the forum and lacerum. And so it's giving the forum and lacerum a roof, traveling over the forum and lacerum, and then takes another um, slightly, almost another 90 degree turn and emerges on the um, medial side of the anterior clinoid process. Um, and penetrates uh, the dura and the arachnoid and enters the subarachnoid space. And so it does all of this before it branches to give rise to the MCA and the PCA and the ACA, pardon me. So again, entering the internal capsule, oh my goodness, entering the carotid canal, giving a roof to the forum and lacerum, tr taking a hard turn emerging medially and penetrating um, the dura and the arachnoid. And that is how it accesses uh, the brain prior to branching to give rise to, to MCA and ACA. Um, it emerges immediately adjacent to the optic chiasm. And at that point, it finally divides into the ACA and the MCA. The ACA is gonna travel anteromedially the MCA is going to travel laterally, and as we'll see, branch. Now, as you learned in 326, the MCA arises from the internal carotid artery uh, and gives um, a blood supply to the majority of the lateral cerebral cortex. So that's represented in um, yellow on this schematic of the brain. Now there are ton tons and tons of branches, which we didn't talk about. So this is the new layer of complexity of 426. A ton of branches of the MCA are found within the lateral sulcus. So it's arriving medially and before, as it spreads laterally over the cortex, both superior to the lateral sulcus and inferior to the lateral sulcus, it gives rise to a whole bunch of branches that crucially supply deep brain structures. So 
that stroke that we saw previously um, of the a, a stroke affecting the posterior limb of the internal capsule is most likely a stroke that affects a distal branch of the MCA. And so we'll look at what those branches are too. Um, so there's different regions and we're going to divide them up and we're going to get beyond an MCA stroke and go into which region of MCA we're actually talking about. So the MCA travels, this is all happening behind the temporal lobe, which is why it's ghosted out, um, traveling medially to this lobe. And it has a whole bunch of insular and opercular branches that are buried within the lateral sulcus. It has a superior cortical division and an inferior cortical division. And so I want you to start by appreciating that there's proximal MCA, there's insular and opercular MCA branches that are sandwiched within the lateral sulcus and hidden away from the surface of the brain. And then spreading over the surface and most distally lies the superior branches, superior cortical branches and the inferior cortical branches. Now, um, the, you can see the full extent by removing the opercula. So operculum is sing singular. Here we're looking at the right hemisphere. And you can see the extent of all these little branches that you can't see without removing the frontal, the parietal, and the temporal opercula. So the little pieces of each lobe that form a lid covering the insular cortex. Um, or the insula simply. And so this is all MCA branches filling that space. Now they're divided, the, we've talked about all these branches and they're divided from proximal to distal into numerical sections. And in fact, most arteries um, are divided like this. And so um, in addition to those numbered sections, which you've already sort of gleaned, because I've already hinted at them, um, there are deeper penetrating branches, and these are the lenticulostriate arteries. Um, and so these, um, the lenticulostriate is a general term, and it encapsulates small perforating branches that arise from the MCA, primarily, as well as the ACA, less so. Um, and so uh, the perforating branches, the lenticulostriates, are the arteries that caused this lacunar stroke. And so um, one of those tiny perforating branches of the MCA, in this case, caused this stroke, which if substantial enough to affect the whole um, posterior limb, could cause paralysis of the whole right side of the body below the neck. And it's because there are so many vessels and they are so small, they are prone to occlusion. So you have all these teeny tiny vessels and you can imagine that it's much easier to wipe out one of them than it is to wipe out the big thick ICA or even the proximal stem of the MCA, which we would refer to as M1. And so now you're mastering, again, layering this on and looking at these in a coronal section. You can see that you have the internal carotid and it arises from here and it branches to the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. Um, and the middle cerebral artery has a proximal stem, M1, it has a whole bunch of small branches collectively referred to as lenticulostriate arteries that are sandwiched um, deep to the lateral sulcus. It has opercular and uh, opercular branches that are within the lateral sulcus itself. And then it has a superior division and an inferior division of cortical branches. So the most proximal segment, as I said, is the M1 segment of the MCA. 
Um, and an M1 stroke would affect a huge swath of cortex ipsilaterally, as well as a whole bunch of deep brain nuclei and deep brain white matter. And so while they're relatively uncommon because the vessel is so large and blood is moving relatively quickly through it from the internal carotid, this proximal um, M1 stroke would have a catastrophic uh, functional outcome. You can see that you could dose that functional outcome. So here's the branch point of the M1 artery from the internal carotid. The further distally, all of this segment is M1, everything in red here on both sides, the further distally you move and occlude that vessel, the less severe the damage will be to the deep brain nuclei. If it's a very proximal M1 stroke that occurred right here, you would lose the entire, all of the circulation to the whole hemicortex. If you had a more distal stroke, say perhaps right here, you would spare some medial lenticular striate circulation and only occlude distal to that point. So always thinking about um, proximal occlusion, more dramatic ischemic and clinical effects. So that's M1. The um, lateral lenticular striate arteries, this is sort of what I've just said, all arise from M1. And so um, they supply most of the basal ganglia um, as well as the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And so that's what I was getting at with that, the initial example we did. The M2 segment is that sylvian segment. Um, and it's almost a purely anatomical division. It's not particularly useful in terms of predicting um, a deficit. You could say, okay, so um, there's uh, an occlusion of the MCA at the junction between M1 and M2 segments. What type of outcome would that have? You could predict that it would affect everything cortically distal to the occlusion site if the occlusion site were right here. Um, but anatomically, it's useful. It gives us a landmark. Clinically, it's really tough to predict uh, wh what an occlusion in M2 would do. It really depends if the superior, whoops, or the inferior cortical branches are affected. I need water. Now, finally, we can go to M3. An M3 segment, as I've already alluded to, have a superior cortical M3 segment superior and cortical M3 segment um, inferior. And the superior and inferior divisions of the M3 MCA are associated with specific stroke syndromes. So did I list what they are? I did not. Okay. So I will give you a moment to think about what those specific stroke syndromes are and how you might distinguish between a superior um, M3 MCA stroke and an inferior M3 MCA stroke. And I will um, pause here for water and thought and we'll come back. <laughs> 